And it starts in, in Matthew chapter 7, and it will be going from verses 1 to 12. You're reading from the NASB. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under your feet, and in turn, and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If then, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Thanks be to God for his wonderful and holy word. So last week, when we were looking at the Sermon on the Mount, we were in chapter 6, um, we covered the passage on riches and worry. And we discovered that verses 19 and 21, and then verses 33 and 34, which is the beginning and the end of, the, of our message that we had last week, they are really bookends to that portion of the scripture that we had our message on. The first bookend was, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, moth, where neither moth nor rust, rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there, it, where, there your heart will be also. And then the ending book into the passage you see, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so that's the framework, and that was the context which Jesus gave us for us to understand that passage. Today's passage has no difference to that. It is quite the same. In verses one, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 7 are that first bookend, and the other bookend is in verse 12, where he says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And this reminds me of my homiletics class in Bible school, where our professor started us with the basic principles of preaching, and they are, first, Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, and then tell them what you just told them. And that's, in a sense, what these bookends are. It's telling them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them what you just told them. So Jesus gives us a perfect framework or structure for the beginning and ending of our message today. And the interesting thing is, is first of all, this framework helps us to keep from falling into traps, because the Sermon on the Mount is neither a bumper sticker statements, statements, just a, a bunch of pithy little proverbial quotes, but rather it is one continuous uh, message that we see here in chapter 7. We could easily fall into that trap of just giving bumper sticker type meme type quotes. Um, because we often, when we come to verse 6, this is where we start to stumble and, and break up, where it says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And that separates it from verses 1 to 5, and it also separates off the section from verses 7 to, to 11, off into its own message. And so often or not, what we see taking place in, in this is we 
often have sermons that are broken up. We have three separate sermons. We have one sermon on about judging other people. We have another sermon about casting pearls before swine. And another one about asking, seeking, and knocking, and a message on prayer. And it's much easier to do it that way than to see the framework that's laid out before us that's couched between verses 1 and 2 and verse 12, and to interpret the context with it, with those in mind. And this, But this is the framework that Jesus has given to us to understand this passage today. And that's not saying that everyone else has it wrong and I have it right, far from it. And most of you know that I'm a stickler for keeping verses in context. And there are great messages that come from this passage that are mined out of those smaller three um, traditionally viewed passages. One about judging others again, one about casting pearls before swine, and the other one about prayer. Because, to be honest, verses 7 to 11 are difficult to interpret and include into the previous verses and to keep the three statements together as one congruent passage, verses 1 to 12, all the way. But there are messages from verses two, from 7 to 11 that are on prayer, and rightfully so, to ask God to seek and to knock and to be persistent, and I might even do that one day soon. But verse 12 brings us to a place where we have to wrestle with the interpretation to help us understand why verses 7 through 11 belong with verses 1 through 6, because of that word, therefore, that is there in verse 12. But the answer to this, and to help us understand this, I believe, is first um, pointed to in verse 11 because Jesus says there in verse 11, he says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In other words, if God is able to give all of his adopted children equally and lovingly. God is, does not play favorites. He is not a respecter of persons, and he does not reject his children and their request based upon their status or station in life. And if our divine Father is able to treat all of us as his children equally, why should we not be able to treat each other equally? Because who of us as parents don't try to te treat, treat our own children equally? Because as children, all we do have to do is ask for help. All we have to do is seek and to knock. And if we even love our children enough to give them proper food and clothing, then the children will know they belong to you and each other, right? And, and as parents, we often often say, stop treating your brother or sister that way. And God, being the perfect, perfect parent, has declared us all equal with each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And he points this out in Galatians chapter 3, where he says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. And Jesus even says in today's passage, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, why? Because we love them? Why would we not see and treat our fellow brother and sister in Christ in the same way that God sees us as brothers and sisters and seeing us all as equals in true spiritual equity, real equity, not the world's current idea of fake equity. But not only this, pay attention here to what he says here in verse 12, where he uses this word, Therefore, which is tying ask and seek and knock then this passage to this following verse where he says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way 
you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. And again, remember, when you ever see the word therefore, you always have to ask yourselves, what is it there for? Why is it there? Because it's referring back to the previous passage to give confirmation and credence to the messenger statement that is to come. A simple way of stating it like this is, 2 plus 2 equals 4, therefore 4 plus 4 equals 8. It's relying on the previous statements for the statements that are about to be put forth, which brings us back to the theme of verses 1 through 6, because that's what he says in, when he says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. Judge not that you be not judged. <clears throat> of judging of others, of one another, in a way that I would want to be judged. Well, how, how, what does that look like? How would I judge other people in a way that I would want to be judged? Well, I want it to be, to be done lovingly. I would want it to be done tenderly. Because that word, therefore, points forward to verse 12, that we need to treat people in the same way that I would like to be treated. And Jesus is directing us to understand what he wants us to understand, what judging others and correcting others really means and what it should look like. And in essence, it is about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. The golden rule. Or what I could, would see and, and what I often, when we take a look at the book of James, I have often said this, and maybe I've said this before in Bible study or in church, that the book of James is often, I would see, as a commentary or an or explanatory of the passages that we see on the Sermon on the Mount. James goes on to reinforce the mountain message of Jesus in James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, because the audience that James is speaking to needs commentary on that. They need to be understand more of the details. And I like that because James helps us out here. Because he goes into detail about how we are often respecters of persons, or that is showing favoritism. Showing one person kindness and deference over another. And when James finishes message, he says this like this in verse 12 and 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So now we come to verse 6 where he says, Jesus says, Do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them under your feet and in and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, what is Jesus trying to tell us here in this passage? Jesus is telling us that we need to be wise and we need to be discriminating with our correction and our discipline. And so what Jesus is calling us to do is not to judge or condemn, but to correct, to admonish, and to discipline. And this has more to do with love towards our brother and even determining who our brother is and who even amongst the brethren um, we need to be discerning in that way because which of our brothers will welcome correction, will welcome admonishment and discipline with joy and with love. Because if we lovingly correct a brother, we expect that correction to be fruitful, right? Um, and, and we would eventually see the benefit of that correction. What would that be? Growth. <clears throat> or if we're corrected by a brother or a sister, do we take it to heart? Or do we, do we accept it with joy and gladness and correct and discipline ourselves because of what we have heard? So we are not to judge one another in a way that makes us superior and puts them, puts them into an inferior position. That is, unless we want to be judged by God and judged by others as well in that same manner. But if we give discipline and correction to someone who does not want any in the first place, we might get ignored or get a fist in the eye at the worst. 
And so that is why Jesus says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw pearls before swine, or they will trample them under your feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So when we correct people, we need to judge whether or not they will take it to heart or not. And frankly, we can even be discerning when we proclaim the gospel. Jesus trained his disciples in Matthew to do this very thing, not to cast pearls before swine. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends out his disciples, and he sends them out to proclaim about his coming kingdom. And he says in verse 14 of Matthew 10, Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. He sent out his disciples, and even in the previous verses that he's before this verse, he says, determine whether they, they are worthy of the news of the coming kingdom or not. We have to ask ourselves, well, how do I do this when the Bible tells us to be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you? Uh, I'd like to give you an example from my personal life that, uh, that happened to me. I, I remember when I worked for a high-tech company where I had a couple different guys that would like to talk to me about my faith. And, and they would constantly be doing this maybe two or three times a week. They would come by and stop and they would talk to me. And they would always have, and then I noticed that they always had this little smile or smirk on their face. And it just made me question. I said, are you asking me questions because you're genuinely interested in learning more about God and are genuinely desiring faith? Or are you just trying to create fear, uncertainty, and doubt in my own faith? Or maybe you're just playing with me and toying with me and asking me questions and thinking about your own superiority towards me. I figured it out that it was never about genuine truth-seeking and sometimes the ability to spot that and figuratively shake the dust off your feet is a good thing to do. Sometimes it's a cause to see that you are genuine in your faith and you really have a sense of who you are in Christ when you push back against their toying with you because that's what does happen from time to time. And so Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 23 that this also was the tactic of the Pharisees, especially when Jesus would speak. They would come to him and ask him questions. And what did he tell them? He said in Matthew 23, verse 4, they tie up heavy burdens and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. They weren't merciful. They weren't seeking God. They weren't seeking the truth of Christ. Um, it's legalism. And James, I really believe and truly believe, he sums up this topic in this last verse that we read earlier, and, and I wish to close with that final phrase, which is in James chapter 2, verse 13. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Did you hear that? I think that's something that's really interesting for us to understand and to hear how we treat other people around us. God is telling us that mercy triumphs. We are not to be judgmental or show favoritism, but as Micah tells us, he has told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and mercy and to walk humbly with your God. In other words, be hard on yourself, be merciful to others, and look to God for mercy and humbleness yourself. First Corinthians tells us, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It says even that love never fails. And this should be the hallmark of a Christian, of showing Christian love, because that is merciful. And mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, 